Please rise. Court is now in session. Justice Facts dissects the most notorious criminal cases making news today. Hello, I'm investigative reporter Robert Riggs, here with decorated former federal prosecutor Bill Johnston. We have been up close and personal with serial killers, mass murderers, sexual predators, and terrorists. You name it, and we've seen it. From the crime scene, to the courtroom, to prison, even the death chamber. We take you behind the scenes into the dark drama surrounding these cases from a perspective that you would never experience on your own. Please be advised that some editions may contain graphic descriptions of violent crime. Here's our latest edition of Justice Facts. Hello, I'm Robert Riggs, here with another episode of Justice Facts, your current events in true crime with my co-host, Bill Johnston, former federal prosecutor. And today we're going to talk about husbands who murder their wives. And Bill, you know, in my 30 years of investigative reporting, I've never done any of these cases, but you have. So I'm going to set this up and we're going to come back to you and this is going to be your episode. So in terms of current trending events, there's been a recent Florida case, a 51-year-old wife sent suspicious text messages to relatives claiming she had a severe case of the coronavirus, that she was being held by the CDC, and later that she'd been placed on a ventilator. Now her relatives started investigating and they filed a missing person report because none of that was true. Two weeks later, the police arrest her 43-year-old husband on kidnapping and murder charges. They said he tried to cover up the murder and her disappearance by concocting the coronavirus story, tapping into something today. Now, it does show the, the link that husbands will go to to try to cover up their crimes and, by, and getting rid of their spouses. But it also demonstrates there's no such thing as the perfect crime. But you were involved in one which almost was. Waco, Texas, 35-year-old Matt Baker, a minister, almost got away with the murder of his wife. He was a charismatic Baptist preacher idolized by his church congregation. His 31-year-old wife, Carrie, was described as the perfect pastor's wife, endowed with a vibrant spirit. Now, Carrie left a typed note on her bedside table before she overdosed on sleeping pills. It read, I want to give Cassidy a hug. I need to feel her again. Now, this occurred in 2006, on the anniversary of the death of their daughter, Cassidy, who had succumbed to brain cancer seven years earlier. And her husband, Matt, the preacher, called 911 a few minutes after midnight to report he thought his wife had committed suicide. And paramedics found Carrie on the floor beside her bed. Her lips were blue. And on the bedside table, they saw a non-prescription sleeping medication with only two pills left in the 32-pill bottle. A police detective dispatched to the preacher's home, called a justice of the peace, and read him the suicide note. They agreed, I mean, this is shocking, they agreed not to order an autopsy, perhaps out of respect for the popular preacher. The Justice of the Peace didn't even come out of the house that night to pronounce Carrie dead as was required by Texas law. Well, shortly after her funeral, her husband, Matt, preaching at an Easter Sunday service, declared that his late wife had made a triumphal entry into heaven. But Carrie's three aunts suspected their niece was the victim of foul play. They had heard rumors that Matt lived a secret life in which he sexually preyed upon young, vulnerable women in the Waco area and at over at Baylor University. So the trio started their own, in, own investigation, and they begged detectives at the Hewitt Police Department to open a criminal investigation. The chief of police of Hewitt reportedly told one of the aunts that she was wasting her time. They went home, and they called you, former federal prosecutor Bill Johnston, the co-host of this podcast. Now, Bill, when you first heard this, why were you suspicious? Why did you jump on this case? What was it just quite right? Their story, uh, that is the, the mother, 
of Carrie and her aunts. Their story about the husband <clears throat> gave a glimpse into a bit of a duality uh, in terms of some other things he had done in the past that gave you a feel that um, this may not be what it appears. Uh, this may be, you know, this could be a weird dude, <laughs> to, put it, to put it in the vernacular, uh, that, that there may be something more to it. So, you know, we didn't have any evidence at first other than what they had and the circumstances. It was obviously poor police work forgetting about what was later established. I mean, the law required an autopsy. It required, uh, in a suspicious death like this, the JP or some other person in authority to come out. Um, the police work was dreadful. The photos were dreadful. They took two or three photos. It turns out one of the sergeants, uh, the sergeant actually who was in charge of the so-called investigation was afraid of bodies and he didn't really want to get oh too God. close so oh sure <clears throat> is the a team yeah. a team was involved you can tell yeah and so he was uh he didn't want to have much in the way of pictures or let, sort of like let's get out of here call the ambulance and let's get out of here did they even take fingerprints on the bottle of sleeping pills they didn't do any crime scene work there they did take a photograph i think they may have taken the note um a couple of photographs that showed the pill bottle. The it was that was one of the first things that we noticed, and I say we. A couple of retired uh, investigators, one from the Marshal Service and one from Texas State Police, that helped me on this. Uh, the The bedside scene looked a little too Marilyn Monroe-ish. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's the bottle. A 50 count, and there's one or two left. So we've taken this, do the, do the math. There's, she's taken 48 of these, uh, of the generic brand of sleeping pill. All right, now that's something I've seen in my career of murders. They will try to stage the crime scene, but they stage it according to what they've seen in movies. And crime scenes are never <clears throat> as portrayed in movies. This case and another one, which we might mention, which was a male bomber tried to blow up his wife, um, both of those cases were solved to a large degree because the suspect just slightly over-engineered the crime scene or some aspect of uh, the evidence Mm -hmm. that was later found. And I'll give you an example with Matt Baker in a moment regarding his computer at work. But uh, at any rate, so in answer to your question, First query, you know, we had this story. We had the crime scene didn't really look right. It was obviously very poor police work. And you started your uh, explanation of this regarding the note. Of course, I'd never seen a type suicide note. Right. That was weird. Right. Uh, never heard of it. I'm sure it may happen, but it was unsigned, of course, as well. I've seen them in a lot of movies. <clears throat> in movies. Yes. And it was unsigned, so there was no nothing attributable to Carrie in handwriting or otherwise on that on that note but uh, you mentioned the anniversary of the daughter's death uh, and you said she died of brain cancer there is compelling evidence that Matt Baker actually killed her no of course she suffered for brain cancer she she had been ill she'd had surgery in fact Matt Baker uh, tried to solicit one of his young nieces to go to a room with him while the daughter was in the hospital in Te- in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. So yeah, his his Was it like a hotel room for Well, sex, they had a or? family room at the uh, mm-hmm. hospital because okay. uh, he's often give family rooms. Sure. And he solicited one of his nieces to go up to the room with him as like an 18-year-old niece. So uh, at any rate when the the daughter came home from that, she had recovered for the most part. She was on oxygen. Matt Baker got up during the night and told the wife, let me go check on the daughter. I think uh, I need to change her diaper or something like that. It's it's Mm -hmm. out of the blue. He leaves. He comes back. This is years before Carrie Baker was murdered. Comes back. And just a little bit later, uh, happened to go in there again. And, oh, she's, she's dying or... It was almost dead. Uh, the oxygen tube was not quite where it should have been. 
I think there was a monitor that may have been turned off. Um, this uh, character, who's in Texas prison now to jump ahead, I thank the Lord, uh, he, he was completely self-serving in everything. He wanted what he wanted. That child, the sick one, was taken away from his free time. And if a preacher's child is uh, dies, the sympathy mm-hmm. and the love offerings that come his way are motivating as well. Which certainly after the death of his wife just came in as an avalanche and the outpouring of affection for him and everything else. Suddenly he, you know, he's the, everybody in Waco is talking about this poor man poor man suffering. You know, uh, there's a great crime scene reconstruction and a blood spatter expert named Tom Bevel yes. uh, out of Oklahoma. Great guy, one of the experts in the world on some of these subjects. When we went to see him with this case and told him the story, just about as much as you and I have talked about today, he stopped and said, when a preacher is having, is he having an affair? We said, well, we're working on that. If a preacher is having an affair, his wife is in grave and immediate danger. And we almost chuckled thinking, well, that's sure. He said, yes. He said, I'm serious. If a preacher is having an affair, his wife is in grave and immediate danger. The reason is, if he's caught having the affair, it's the end of his career. If his wife dies, she's murdered by a third party, she dies of suicide, his career is enhanced. It, it blossoms into not only whatever he was, but now this poor victim, this poor widower. Mm-hmm. And what did you see had happened to him in the wake of this? Uh, Baker? Yes. Oh, of course. Yes, he became he became the poor fellow that um, uh, everyone now uh, uh, worships, so to speak. Yes. And promoted, and uh, it happened when his daughter uh, died, and it happened all the more when he murdered his wife and faked it as a suicide. You know, I can imagine. I've seen this uh, growing up in the Baptist Church in Texas that. At the end of the service, the minister is standing at the door as the congregation is leaving, and I've, and I can see him standing there and taking the women's hands and patting them, or them taking his hand and patting it. So the man had to have been above suspicion. What was the background that the three ants? What did they know? The secret. They always thought he was a little too handsy, as you say uh-huh. there that he um, had, the way he looked at other women, the way he looked at younger women was odd. There was a strange strange incident that a, he was a summer uh, counselor, for lack of a better term, when he was at Baylor University at First Baptist Church in Waco. And they had a skating party of some sort. And there was about a 14 year old girl that was skating around, and this character, this Matt Baker, was seen uh, so close to her that it was almost assaultive looking. It was strange looking, and it frightened the little girl. The uh, someone with the church said something, and one of our investigators, uh, the Marshal Mike McNamara, who you who you knew, well, who's from our. True Crime Reporter That's episode right. and the hunt for the serial killer yes. Kenneth McDuff. Mike, unfortunately, has passed, but yes. he did it with his brother uh, Parnell, uh, who both were legends in the Marshal Service. And, of course, Parnell today is the sheriff of McLennan County based in Waco. That's right. And so Mike helped me with this Baker case. He'd retired from the Marshals, and he went down. He knew everyone in Central Texas. He went down and spoke with some assistant preacher or director of some sort of this summer program and ask him did, about this incident with Matt Baker and about this 14-year-old girl and you know, just and the man said to him well Mike uh, we they said Mike said what'd you do to him? did you fire him did you report to the police did you well no uh, he has a calling he's going to the seminary and we don't want to interfere with that if the Lord's called him, we don't want to interfere with that. Now, it so happens that Matt Baker 
you ask about what the sisters knew and what others suspected. When Matt Baker was at Baylor, about the same time before he went to the seminary, he tried to rape a, he was a trainer for the football team. Mm -hmm. And after everyone was gone and the locker rooms were being cleaned by he, by Matt Baker, and a young woman, he tried to rape her. He forcefully uh, dragged her toward a, an area of the locker room where no one could see him if they came in. He tried to pull her pants off and did everything he could uh, to sexually assault her. Uh, she reported it to Baylor, and Baylor said, well, we will take care of it. And, of, and she left. She was horrified. She left Waco. She never came back. So, and it turns out, of course, they did nothing to him whatsoever. And let me interject here. You represented some of the victims of sexual assault by members of the football team that was apparent condoned by the or covered up by the university and the coaching staff. Is that the same environment of permissiveness and, and, and cover up of sexual assault that was that going on way earlier? There's something, uh, you know, there's there are wonderful things about religious institutions and schools. Um, they can do so much good, and there's often, you know, great faculty and all that. The other side of that is that they don't want to look bad. The worst thing in the world a religious institution wants is to look like they are just as sinful as everyone else and hypocritical. And that's what happened with Matt Baker's attempted rape of this trainer. Years, this is years before he murdered his wife. This is years before he uh, may have finished off his young daughter who was ill. Um, at any rate, they did nothing. And you know that uh, when we were working on this, a friend of ours at the local police department said, that name is familiar, Matt Baker. That's familiar. And a day or two later, she said, she told us, she was a detective, she said, why don't you do an open records request? Let me tell you kind of what you should ask for. So we did an open records request, and we got some records. And someone had blacked us. It was a brief description of this incident in the locker room where this preacher, now preacher, mm -hmm. had attacked this young lady in the locker room. And they blacked out her name, of course. But it must have been done with a little thin mark slot because we held it up to the light and we saw her name. And we found her in Midland, Texas. She later testified at his trial and described what happened to her. And this had all been swept under the rug and lost to history, lost to time. And uh, at any rate, so you ask, what was it about Matt Baker that made us wonder? This is, mm -hmm. These are the sorts of things that began to collect. And th that's apart from the forensics. And the forensics are unbelievable. We were so lucky to have gotten some of the greatest forensics people around, from computers to toxicology to crime scene. All right, so walk me through that now, so, especially the computer. Well, we... Again, we had now a strong suspicion. In fact, what we, when, when uh, Carrie Baker's mom, Linda, when she came to us with the case, and uh, she said, I, I guess my daughter's killed herself, but I hate to think that. And my sisters think, she said, the aunts, think this guy is not right and may have done something to her. And I, I don't know. I don't know if it's worse, worse to have your daughter murdered or kill herself. But anyway, if you can help me. And so we gathered a few things together. We looked at a few things, and I told her, give us a month or so, and we'll get back with you. And so during that time, we gathered some of the things I've told you about now, and we decided that we were morally convinced he was good for it, but we didn't have the facts to prove it. So we wanted to try to let forensics carry the day rather than our opinions and our experience. We, first of all, there were... Again, these few crime scene photos. We went to Tom Bevel in Oklahoma, this incredible expert uh, on crime scene reconstruction who wrote the book on it, teaches at Scotland Yard and elsewhere. And Tom Bevel, first of all, said, oh, great. He looked at the pictures. Where are your crime scene pictures? We said, well, we, we gave them to you. He said, no, I mean the, the police crime scene pictures. Where are they? And we said, well, these oh, little, no. these little, you know, practically little Polaroid looking things, that's it. He said, you, you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, he looked at them, and 
Matt Baker um, told a story to the police. They interviewed him briefly that he had that his wife was nude when he came back from running an errand. He found her nude and found her uh, unconscious and perhaps dying, and but she was naked. Tom Bevel, after some study, told us that's a lie. Now, this may be a small thing. She she dressed herself, okay? So why would he say that? We later had a theory. But that's that's an, an initial thing that we looked at. Was, but Tom had seen this in other cases, <clears throat> though, this kind of thing that takes place. See, here, Matt Baker had some problems. He, he had a great idea for a killing, great idea. Uh, you'll have someone that's dejected. He'll claim he'll claim he was sent on an errand, so he has an alibi. He even produced the the gas receipts just very quickly to the police. Oh, I was down the street getting gas. We were going to run errands tomorrow, and she asked me to fill up the gas for the errands tomorrow. Fill up the car with gas for the errands, and to go get a movie, her favorite movie. This was like midnight. Didn't really make sense, but he had all the receipts, and all he knew he'd be on video. He'd have the receipts, so he had a little alibi. But he had a problem with that. They had two young, young girls by now. They had two healthy young girls. They were little girls. He probably shouldn't leave the house mm-hmm. for a long time. That looks irresponsible. That's not a good Baptist preacher, Daddy. Uh, so he can't be gone a couple hours, of course. But he wants to be gone. But when he comes back, he describes to the ambulance, to the on the 911 call, and thereafter, when he came back, her lips were blue. She was already cold. Well, doggone it for him. That just doesn't really work out. Not enough time. Not enough time. And worse, and this is what our crime scene guy helped us with, she had lividity and, and really double lividity. Now, lividity is a purplish color that a body gets when it's uh, after it's it's died, the person's died, and it's a pooling of blood that, yes. that results in the lower extremities. She had it, Carrie Baker had lividity, uh, noticed by the ambulance team, but she even had lividity double. So in other words, she had it, she was moved, and she got it again on the other side, So, which meant she had been moved. Oh. She had died, been still for quite some time, and then she had uh, been moved again. The way that shook out for us forensically was she was probably, by the time the ambulance people got there at midnight, she had probably been dead. Um, an hour and a half to two hours. He probably killed her way before, killed her first, then thought about the alibi, then did the, then did the mm-hmm. alibi. Uh, so that's that part of it. Um, he, th- there was this little sleeping pill. It was just uh, really supercharged Benadryl. It was that over-the-counter stuff. Yeah. And uh, we didn't know if there's anything else in her system. Well, gosh, She's been buried. We had to go with the help of a Texas Ranger by this time who we had courted into helping us on this case. The Hewitt police mm-hmm. didn't want any part of it. They'd already solved the case. Because they knew they were going to get embarrassed. Well, it was a suicide, of course. Yes, they, yes, they would be yeah. highly embarrassed. But it was just a suicide. And poor preacher, you know. So they're going to exhume the body? So we, we, with the help of a Texas Ranger who was uh, agreed to help us on the case, got a court order to get her exhumed. And when she was exhumed, uh, she was sent for an autopsy. Mm-hmm. Now, post-exhumation autopsies never as good, never as helpful or as revealing. Uh, but it did show some things, including the toxicology of a couple of weeks or so later showed there was the presence. Now, they couldn't tell how much, how strong, because... Not the same in an exhumation, but in her muscle tissue was a little bit of Ambien, the sleeping, okay. the prescription sleeping pill, just a little bit. Of course, we checked with everyone, her mother, her aunts, everyone that knew her. Did she have prescription up for it? No. Did any family member? No. So that led us to wonder about the computer evidence. Gosh, wonder if anybody... Well... Matt Baker, the killer here, the preacher, it turns out his computer at the house, he'd, he'd thrown it out. It wasn't, as he said, as he told me in a deposition, wasn't compat with his printer. And so, they, you know, no need to keep it, so that was gone. 
So we went to his work. Uh, not the church work. He had a side hustle. Oh. He was a wonderful and helpful chaplain at the Waco Center for Youth, which was a place for kids that need help. Some of them orphans, some of them have mm-hmm. trouble, and some of them just uh, you know need good guidance. And so he was a chaplain there. Okay, so but wait a minute. You and I both know from doing sexual predator cases these. You know, this is where where predators look for vulnerable young women. Couldn't or, have had a, couldn't have had a better spot. Oh boy! So he works. So he's a chaplain mm-hmm. at the Waco Center for Youth. And so Mike McNamara, our former marshal, helping me on this case privately, uh, retired from the marshals. He went out there and and you know we were. Here, we're privately prosecuting this. So in other words, there's no law enforcement investigation yeah. ahead of us. We're sort of trying to gather things and giving it to law enforcement. We're doing the best we can in the private world. We had almost nothing to work with. And the tough thing for you, like the tough thing for me as an investigative reporter is we don't have subpoena power. And so you've got to really think things through, try to get records publicly, and more important, burn some shoe leather and talk to a lot of people. And you just hope you can get people to talk to you because, as you said, you don't have subpoena power. You can't, you can't summon anyone in. And so we had Mike McNamara, who born and raised in mm-hmm. Central Texas, knew everybody, and yeah. and we were trying to do the right thing. And I think yeah. that sort of that feeling yeah. went came across to people. And you know, Mike could have probably <clears throat> talked his way out of the Alamo, knowing Mike. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He probably could have. And he and he just got along with everybody, and was so pleasant and smart. And so when he went out to the Waco Center for Youth, this this um, place where Baker was a chaplain, he learned two or three things that were just so odd and so helpful and so strange. One is uh, he went and talked to his secretary, who was nice enough, and said, oh, yeah, Matt, yeah, said, uh, he didn't really leave his office. Well, do, when did he go chaplain these, you know, when was he helping these these yeah. people, and when was he doing ministering, his, ministering, Bible studies, or helping the kids? She said, "Well, he didn't really leave the office very much. He didn't leave the office very much, uh, but I don't remember him doing any, you know, oh, group boy. counseling or anything." And then Mike went and talked to the IT guy for the campus, and he said, "You know, something strange did happen." He said, "You need to talk to this this uh, woman who works over here. She saw something." Uh, Yes, uh, maybe on a state holiday after the murder, when we started looking into it, so we're already sort of Mm -hmm. walking around talking to people, he was seen leaving the Waco Center for Youth with something very large uh, and heavy, put it in the trunk of a car and left. It was was wrapped up, but it was just odd. It was on a state holiday. No one else was really there, but one woman saw him. And the IT guy said, yeah, you know, at the same time, the same – State holiday, um, on that Monday, when no one was here, his our server shows, because Baker was thought about his tower, he didn't think about the server. The oh, ser- and so they yeah. said, you know what's weird? It said the, uh, his computer went offline and his secretaries went offline with, within a minute or two. <clears throat> and... Then uh, it seemed like they went – one of them went back online in a different configuration. And what had happened, we figured out, was <clears throat> Baker got his secretary's computer, switched it with his. All the little stickers mm-hmm. that had been – on his computer, he put on hers, and he took hers, and when she came in the next day, she said, my computer's gone. Well, it wasn't her computer. It was his. It had been switched and taken. And so his computer, the tower, again, he was quite clever, but not quite clever enough. <clears throat> his tower was hers. So if he thought all the information's in there, he's good. It's hers. And it wasn't hers that was taken. It was his. But the server, doggone it for him. Yes. <laughs> the server. Uh-huh. And so the we we asked for help, and, and this IT guy 
helped us. And he said, let me look and let me search and let me, let me give this to you guys on a, I don't recall if it's a flash drive or in those days a disc. And you want to know his search history. You also want to know what he's downloaded or ordered online. So his search, mostly what he searched for and spent his time on the computer was pornography. That was the preacher's main uh, interest on the computer. But Mike and I, McNamara and I, put that disc in and spent six or seven hours and about starting one evening. And about two or three in the morning, as we're scrolling and searching through files, we see the word Ambien. We see the word Ambien. It didn't make sense. It was in a, it was with, uh, you know, sometimes on the computer, there'll be just a scrabbled looking, Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what it meant even. So we got, we packaged that whole thing up, sent it to Noel Kirsch in Houston, Texas, who was a forensic computer expert. And Noel took some time with it and said, your guy went out to an online pharmacy, an offshore pharmacy, and he ordered Ambien. And he put it in the cart, and from, for all we can tell from his entry, he got some Ambien in the weeks leading up to the murder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now we have something that helps our theory. Our theory was, based on the way the few photos looked, based on the Ambien, and, and based on a drink she said she asked for, he, he, he said she wanted a wine cooler of a certain variety. We our theory was he put Ambien, crushed up Ambien, one or two or three of them, put it in her drink. It made her sleepy, maybe very sleepy. And then he put a pillow over her face okay. and suffocated. That was our theory. And it yes. was a theory because we saw pillows that were sort of a coarse woven, mm-hmm. heavy enough pillow. We also saw uh the wine cooler and now we now we know he ordered Ambien, and, and now he's, we he's, know he switched his computer for a reason. Yeah, because he's is this after the exhibition? Or? This was about the same time. About the same time. Okay, so he knows. Uh oh, they're yep. going to find traces. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, this is probably two weeks after the exhumation. Okay. So now we have the science. There's Ambien. Now we have the record he searched and yes. ordered Ambien, and so now we're starting to put it together. And, uh, and had the cooler been collected so the residue could be tested, or was it, again, just terrible? Of course work? not. Of oh, course God. not. Oh, it had been thrown out. You know, we did an experiment. Again, we're just private, you know, mm-hmm. guys doing this. We had a we found a guy uh, that one one of our friends knew that had an Ambien prescription. He had sleeping problems, and he had an Ambien prescription. We asked him to come to our office. We ordered the same wine cooler. We ordered six of them. We asked him if we could use his Ambien and do an experiment. And he said, absolutely. We crushed up a couple of Ambien, used a mortar and pestle, try to really get it mm-hmm. ground up, mm-hmm. poured it into the wine cooler, one of them, and we put three others out there. And we, so we had Ambien in one of them and the others, nothing, just the wine cooler. He tasted all of them for us as much as he wanted to. And we asked him, do do any of them taste different from the other? He said, I can't tell any difference in any of them. And we had him guess and everything else, and he couldn't identify that Ambien made the taste different. So she would not have She would not have known. Right. So that was helpful, too. Were you able to to get any forensic evidence from the pillow in either her nasal passages or the lungs or well of course it's too late too late too late late. late. and you know had had they had they done an autopsy quickly Mm -hmm. afterwards they might have seen that pratiki in the eye which is the which is the uh oh the expansion or reddening of the blood vessels in the eye when someone is strangled yes or is suffocated you get a they call it pratiki i believe i'm pronouncing that correctly and that um that is a, a telltale sign mm-hmm. of strangulation or uh, asphyxiation because someone struggle you're struggling so hard to get breath and you the eyes the eyes engorge with blood and none of that was none of that was available of course so do we get to the point where Carrie's parents file a civil suit and now you have the opportunity to do a deposition I didn't know how else to get certain evidence because we'd done all we could 
And I thought, you know, I'm going to sue this guy for wrongful death under Texas civil law. And I sued him for wrongful death and for reasons I'm sure having to do with his arrogance and his misplaced confidence, he let me take his deposition not once but twice. Oh, boy. Well, that is an arrogance. I'm bulletproof. And the first first one wasn't great. Uh, I limited my questions. I didn't know enough to ask a lot. I did let him paint a bit of a picture of what happened, mm-hmm. just to put it down. But he got a different lawyer, and uh, I thought, you know, that deposition was it was cut short. I don't remember the reason uh, exactly, but it was cut short, mm-hmm. so it didn't qualify as a full deposition. I was allowed to propose to take yeah. another one. And you're on a fishing ep- expedition. Oh, absolutely. Here. Absolutely, and he's a, he's a defendant, he's a witness, and I want to ask him questions. And so I asked him I, he, at his lawyer's office in the Hill Country of Texas one day. I went down there with a court reporter and preacher Baker and his lawyer, and again, for whatever reason, his lawyer thought this was a grand idea too. And I asked him a number of preliminary questions. My attitude with him was, poor, poor Matt, you poor fella. So mm-hmm. sorry about the, all this. Let's ask a few questions here and see if we can mop this up. Uh, you poor fella. You poor preacher. Uh, and so I let him describe the crime scene, and I and I tried to, with my questions, if I was doing a good job, I tried to be specific enough so that every time frame, every detail of everything that happened would be stated by him and restated to the concrete hardened on those things. Yes. And And – and it did. And the picture he painted again was about a 15 to 18 minute time frame was all that he was gone. And, you know, I thought, you know, I wonder another tack he could take is he could say maybe he, maybe she was already getting sleepy, you know, and maybe she was she'd already taken the suicide pills. Uh, you know, maybe he because mm-hmm. he's now he's getting a time frame problem. Right. So I thought, well, so I said, now your other daughters were in the house. Oh, sure. And I said, and you're a good dad that, you know, you, you look after your girls. Oh, yes. And uh, now, Mr. Baker, preacher, uh, had your wife been in the least bit incapacitated, you would have never left your house uh, without a proper adult in good shape, alert, awake, taking care of those girls. Oh, of course not. So Carrie was fine when you left her. Well, she, uh, yeah, uh, yes. He said, so we pinned that down so that the alibi couldn't have couldn't been pre time predated yes. with an early intake of the pills. So for our listeners, this is what we investigative reporters and prosecutors and detectives that are good interrogators call leading them down the primrose path. <laughs> and, you know, there there was one other little thing I just had to do. And it was I just couldn't help it. Uh, we had had a call. See, Matt Baker left Central Texas and moved out to the hill country of Texas when the heat started really getting up and moved back in with his parents. <laughs> and again, Mike McNamara uh, and our other investigator got a call from a woman down there and said, uh, this guy that was on the front of Texas Monthly Magazine, I didn't know anything about this guy. Uh, he... Uh, he came to me to get a haircut, and one thing led to another, and and he came to my house, and we had sex, and I can tell you, you know, it was consensual, but I think if I'd have said no, it would, wouldn't have been okay, mm-hmm. and it was weird, and I'm not complaining about it, but I just want to let you know I had no idea who this was. I would not have ever let him in my home. So we had that. She was very credible. And Texas Monthly came and did a feature story that in some ways was sympathetic and then it raised his suspicion. So he was feeling the heat. He was on the, it, it was front cover. He was on the front cover of a prominent magazine that's not only read in Texas, but in New York and sure. California and elsewhere. And he was on there holding his cross and a Bible and looking just so pitiful. He was on the front page and the headline or the, the uh, wording just above him was, did this Baptist preacher murder his wife? That was the question on the cover of the magazine. So when I took his deposition, I just had to go there. I said, Matt, uh, preacher, you you lost your wife. Oh, yes. You've lost your daughter. Yes, yes. And now, Matt, um, that was terrible. And you were loyal to her. And 
And in fact, Matt, I didn't know the answer, but I thought I knew in my questionnaire. I said, Matt, in fact, it's rough on you and you're still grieving. Yes, I am. Matt, in fact, you've never even, you haven't even, you haven't married anybody else. You haven't, I, I bet you haven't even had sex with anyone else, have you, Matt? Oh, no, 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 I just, I just can't do it. I can't bring myself to having a relationship. He said, well, now the hook was set in the gills. And so I said, Matt, since you moved back down here out in the country, do you get your hair cut? He started, the color in his face started changing. And I said, he said, of course, yes. And I said, "Uh, and, and is it a girl or boy cuts your hair, man or woman? Well, I oh both, and I said, "Did you have a woman that cut your hair?" Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And did you go to her house after a haircut one time? Uh, don't know. I may, may have. I don't know. And I said, <laughs> "You did, and you went to her house, and one thing led to another, didn't it?" Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, "And y'all had sex at her house, didn't you?" Not that there's anything wrong with that, Matt, mm-hmm. but you did. And he, he got red-faced and flustered, and he said, I, oh, okay, I gratificated her, whatever, whatever that means. Gratificated her, oh, my God. <laughs> whatever that means. And that, Versus fornicated her. Right, you know? right. So and that didn't have anything to do with anything else. I just couldn't leave that alone. Mm-hmm. His hypocrisy was so bitter in my mouth uh, that I thought, you know, I've got to ask. So, I mean, you've been in the same room with serial killers and looked them in the eye and other killers. Uh, and we've talked about what it was like to sit in the room with Kenneth McDuff, the, the notorious serial killer in Texas. What was it like sitting with this man who you believe has murdered his little girl and certainly murdered his wife? The way I saw my role at that time... I knew I was really lucky to get this deposition. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, every minute I kept thinking they're going to plead the Fifth Amendment. So I, ha- I was so focused. I was so focused on it that until that last little fun I had with him about this uh, person he got with, I was so focused that I can't tell you how I felt. I was. I had every question in mind. I had every answer. I was listening to every answer as if it was... Um, mm-hmm. as if it was being broadcast across the world. I was trying to listen to every inflection, every word. So I didn't, I didn't think much about it until the end uh, when I had a little – I toyed with him a bit over this other thing. And then I looked at him and, and thought – I, I can't think of a good word for it. I thought what a you know, waste of humanity this was in front of me. And the fa- – and I had – of course, I have kids – and. And it all came to me that not just what he did to this woman, who Carrie Baker was a sweet, nice, right. nice woman, right. what he did to her family, and worst of all, what he did to his two girls, because he had two young girls. They yes. were young. Now you've killed their mother, you piece of crap, and now you're going, I hoped, you're going to prison. So what do they do? What do they do? Their own father killed their mother. And and I've had other cases like this mm-hmm. involving uh, – Spouses that have been killed. But that's what came over me, being in a room with him at the very end. So you have a deposition that's incriminating. You've got this evidence, the Ambien, uh, the evidence the body was moved. What do you do with this? How does this get him to trial? Well, this where this got us is all, was sort of to um, a place with our work as far as we could go. We now had all of that we've talked about, plus we believed we had a girlfriend identified. Uh, we believed that he was having an affair with a music minister's daughter. Oh, no. And we had some evidence of it. We talked to her. It didn't add up what she told us, but she didn't admit anything. All of that combined was with the help of a Texas Ranger, uh, Matt Cawthon, who, who was great on this case. And he... Now we had a silver platter with goodies on it to hand off to law enforcement, to hand off to the DA's office, and that's what happened. So they took it from there. The primary thing they accomplished that we could have never done, they subpoenaed this girlfriend to the grand jury, 
And of course, she wants to plead the fifth. And so they immunized her and said, okay, now you, now nothing can happen to you. You have to tell us. And she told a story that was later told in trial that was one of the most horrifying things you'll ever hear. And many people have said, why would they immunize her when she wasn't involved but knew everything thereafter and lived and stayed with this guy for a while? Um, well, it was a it was a decision they made, but Baker told her how he killed her. He told her exactly what happened. Did she know before? That she claimed she didn't right. know before. She claimed right. she didn't know before. And what did he tell her? He told her, well, it was kind of our theory. It, he told her that he uh, got her sleepy, that he went in there, put a pillow over her face, that he got up on it to suffocate her. And this is terrible, I'm going to tell you now. That he had her suffocated, he had her dead. He took the pillow off and looked at his handiwork, and she gasped, sucked in as much air as she could get, Carrie Baker did, and he put the pillow back on and finished the job. She had tried to come back to life, and he finished her off, and he told this to this, this woman, and she told the jury, and that and the, all the other things we've talked about, including the woman from West Texas, way out in Midland, who came in to say he tried to rape me, all these other circumstances, and we found out he had been brushed from one church to the next to the next when he acted weird or something happened, and just, nobody ever did anything to him. Just passing their problem. Passing the problem along. Did his girlfriend say why? Did he tell her why? I, you know, I don't recall exactly. It had, the, motive, the motive I think he gave her was, essentially, I killed her for you so we could be together. And I'm, I'm really paraphrasing okay. there, but that was the idea of it. But I tell you that my, my investigators – believed it was more so he was a dark angel, as they call it. Mm -hmm. In other words, he sort of decides who lives and dies. Yeah. Uh, perhaps he's a bit of an eraser. You know that after we had evidence that the day after he had killed Carrie, or she killed herself, according to him, all the magnets on his refrigerator of pictures and family pictures were gone, and pictures of the new mommy were up on the refrigerator. The, yes. the girlfriend. Yes, the next day, the new, this is your new. This will be your new mommy. Just erased her from, erased her from uh, any recollection by anyone in his family. Erased, took her off the refrigerator. So probably, you know, he's an utterly selfish, psychopathic, uh, mm -hmm. sociopathic, perhaps uh, killer. Um, would he kill again? I think absolutely he'd kill again. Uh, did he, had he done anything before other than the daughter? Probably not. But sexual assault was his game, I think, early on. Yeah. How much time did he get? And will he ever see? I believe his sentence was 60 years. Okay. And there was a day in Texas that would have meant five or six or seven years. But oh, no, there was a man. guy named Kenneth McDuff and the a guy named Dr. Of, James Granberry. Yeah, that are the subjects of our true crime reporter, Free to Kill. True crime Change reporter. The law. True crime reporter tells a story that... All of the law in Texas was changed after Kenneth McDuff killed again. And so Matt Baker will have to do half or more of his sentence before he's even eligible for parole. And I would hope that he would never get parole. So it should do him in. But let's see. And my sense of the, the, these killers that are control freaks, it's about control and power. Oh, boy, prison's a tough place for them because they, they don't have it anymore. Yes. They're going to try to manipulate people around him, but they don't have it. My guess is, and I haven't gotten a report on him, I uh, haven't heard much about him. My guess is he'll play two cards at once. He'll be the guy that's so tough he killed, and he'll mm -hmm. be the the uh, the chaplain to the wing, yes. the chaplain to the unit, and lead these people where he wants them to go. Oh, I've seen that. He, he will be the model prisoner. He will try to get the inmate trustee status to be uh, the file clerk in the warden's office yes. and stuff like that. You yes, know? and you know these these wardens got to be on top of things because these guys are looking for that opportunity. Well, you've got some real. Yeah. You know, I mean, these manipulators and and yeah. when you have a tremendous manipulator yeah. who's also a killer, that's the worst. So here's my other bet on this: just all these years of being in maximum security prisons doing stories, I bet you. 
He's got some women that are his pen pals. I've, I've seen this phenomena where women's will fo- women will follow these cases and start writing these men. Uh, he gets the, they, he gets the, the women to send in money for his commissary account. Now the, yes. The commissary account is where you can go buy what you don't get in the dining hall. And, you know, you, you don't get ice cream and candy and these other things. And these things have a, an exaggerated value in the prison system. I will bet you he is working them. And if he had a chance, he's out that prison door and they're waiting for him. And yes. Escape. You know, there was a there was a book, an excellent book about this story. Uh, there, he has been on national television. Mm-hmm. Well, really, it's been it was it's, it was in Europe as well because I had a friend that saw it there. But he was on, I think, Forty Eight Hours Mysteries. He's been, I think, it may be still on. He's sure. been on, and you would think instead of you would think the effect of that on people would be, oh my gosh, what a horrible person. There are a few women yes. for whatever reason it attracts them, and I've never understood. I don't know the whole bad, but it's big. It is big in the prison system. Okay, we're going to take a break. We'll give everybody a message here about True Crime Reporter. And when we come back, I'm gonna, I want to pick up with the bomber that did his wife. Okay, we'll be right back. Okay, so we've been talking about the case of the Baptist preacher who murdered his wife and almost got away with it in Waco. But you've got another case similar of someone blowing up their wife. There was a uh, situation over in East Texas where an an estranged relationship existed where a woman uh, and her husband were not getting along well, and she was about ready to move on. He was kind of a weird guy, and uh, she had enough of him. And... Uh, no one thought anything much would happen with it. She just thought in time she would get away from him. And one day she worked for the probation department uh, in that county, small county. One day a box came, <clears throat> wasn't addressed to her. It was addressed to the probation department. And it was a heavy box that had come by United States mail. Um, and the supervisor of the office received it he couldn't get it out of the uh he couldn't get the the inside of it from the outside it was a package that had a metal box in it and he Mm -hmm. couldn't get it out and he actually banged it on a desk oh no banged it on a desk and finally loosened it and opened it and a, a click took place and within 30 seconds, everyone ran out of that building screaming. It was a double pipe bomb, heavy pipe, mm-hmm. uh, heavy screwed in ends on both, double, with so-called refrigerator switches. So when it, when the lid pops up, much like when your refrigerator door opens, the light comes on, it completes right. the circuit. They pop. <clears throat> the... Bomb disposal unit, the EOD out of Fort Hood, Texas, was asked to come up. It was the closest. It was the closest place where anybody knew anything about bombs. <clears throat> they came up, and they one brave soldier carefully carried uh, this this object, this box, to the middle of the courthouse square. They placed it down. They put sandbags all around it, thousands of pounds of sandbags, and they commenced to disarm it somewhat remotely, and it blew up. And I had a photo for trial. It was a fireball about four feet in diameter, and I had an ATF bomb expert out of uh, Tennessee who said that had that happened in the probation department, it would have killed everyone in there. It would have killed everyone in the bank next door, and it would have collapsed the entire part of the block. It was so large. And she further said, and I cannot tell you why it did not go off. Because Mm. everything I saw, everything that remained, and everything I saw in the photos, or actually photos of it before it went off, it appeared to be a perfectly put together, huge pipe bomb, double pipe bomb. Uh, Lauren Bruce Pearson is this character. And he 
was uh, had had it with his wife. She wasn't going to be leaving him. She wouldn't get away from him and be in one piece. And so he, uh, we believed, had constructed the bomb, had taken it to a post office a long way away and mailed it. It was mailed maybe 200 miles from where <clears throat> it arrived. So he didn't want anybody to know she was the target, so he's just going to take the whole office out. It was clever. He was going to just kill everyone in the office and everyone in the bank. He didn't care. Uh, there might be 10 or 15 people killed, but she'd be one of them. He knew she was at work that day. And uh, he was very clever because uh, he was a suspect in it. Um, we had circumstantial evidence uh, that pointed uh, to it. And, you know, we had the packaging of the bomb. We, that is to say the paper part. Uh, there were no fingerprints on it. There was no evidence of human uh, touching in any mm-hmm. way. And uh, a search warrant of his home was done. We, we wrote a search warrant, just put the best facts we could together. It was thin. They went to his home. There was no black powder. There was no pipe. There were no tools to make a pipe bomb. It was clean. Uh, they did take his computer as a part of the search warrant. And... He had just over-engineered this a bit. Everyone's computer, uh, I mean, I think every computer sold in the last 30 years, has New Times Roman as a font. Yes. I think it's the first one that comes up. Uh The label, the tape label for the bomb was printed in New Times Roman font. Well, so what? I mean, so what? Well, when computer experts looked at his computer, the WIN file, and I don't know much about it, but Mm -hmm. apparently a change made file or an entry into the sort of the coding part of the computer showed on the day of the bombing, the day the bomb was arrived, he deleted New Times Roman from his computer so that, (laughs) so that his computer could not have printed the label because mm-hmm. he didn't have New Times Roman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very clever. Uh, but anyway, so that was found. <clears throat> and then the rest of the evidence, I mean, we just didn't have much else. We needed something forensically besides that and besides a motive and besides a few people that knew he had said some things, not saying he was going to blow her up, but it said some yes. things he might not let her leave him. And But we didn't want him out. We didn't want him to, he didn't kill her the first time. We didn't want him to get out. Well, it turns out they had had a little trouble a few weeks before, and the wife had gotten what is called a family violence protective order. And this was a new thing, <clears throat> not a restraining order, not a peace bond. This was a family violence protective order. And He had been given notice of it. There was a short hearing, and a judge signed a family violence protective order against him, uh, trying to keep him away from her. This was just leading up to the when he sent the the bomb. And when they searched the house on our search warrant, there was a thirty thirty rifle. Well, again, so what? He wasn't a convicted felon. He can have a rifle. And I remembered that. Congress had just passed something called the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, the Violence yes. Against Women Act. Right. Uh, it was a big deal. We hadn't received any training on it, but I remembered that it existed, and I called some people with the Justice Department. Yeah, it's – what do I have to have? Well, you have to have a family violence protective order where the person got notice. Okay, got that. And then they have to be in possession of a firearm. That's it? Yep. So I charged him. He's the first person in the United States charged under the uh, Violence Against Women Act with being a person under a protective order being in possession of a firearm. So I, kind of like in the Kenneth McDuff serial case, how I went after him on a tab of LSD. We talked yes. about that in our True right. Crime Reporter podcast. Right. At any rate, but uh, so I went after him, had him, the grand jury indicted him for this Violence Against Women Act, and at the detention hearing, I put on a lot of evidence about the bombing. I couldn't prove it yet, but I, had, I was getting there. And so um, in that case, the federal magistrate said, I'm not going to set a bond, no bond. He's staying in jail. This is too dangerous. So we held him for months and months uh, uh, on that case, working toward a trial in that case, while the 
actually the postal labs was the forensic agency while they worked on everything else. And you know, the strangest thing, again, he had no, he left no fingerprints on the, on the package. The tape had no, it was taped up, had no fingerprints, no human mm-hmm, hair in it. Mm-hmm. But when they looked at it, there was a strange thing. It was a, appeared to be an animal hair, but more like a cattle, a hair from cattle. Yes. You know, this guy didn't have any cattle and didn't live near cattle. Uh, they said it was a animal hair with an ovoid body, another a dark ovoid body. So in other words, there were these little blips in, a, in what looked like a clear hair of dark ovals, microscopically. And they saw that, uh, but it didn't mean anything to us. Again, again it, they said it's typically found in cattle. Well, so we talked to them, got them to give us a little information, and I wrote a second search warrant. And we asked permission from the federal judge to vacuum his house and to take his vacuum if it were still there. Yes. And we did both. The, the agents went out. They vacuumed his house. They took his vacuum was, vacuum was there. They took the bag. Sent it to the postal labs, and not not soon. It, it took a while. They were working on it. They didn't know. Maybe this, maybe that. And I thought, well, I guess I'll try him on the one case. He won't get much time. You know, he's not going to get a very big sentence on this firearm case. And we got a call one day, and they said, uh, "Did he have a? Did he have a dog? Kind of a big mixed breed dog?" We said they did. Just a big. Almost Great Dane looking, but it mm-hmm. wasn't. It was a big mm-hmm. mixed breed. Well, that's it. Um, this is very strange hair. We don't see it. It's not one in a million, but it's almost. Um, you vacuumed clear hairs with ovoid bodies that totally match the clear hair with ovoid bodies, the single hair on the tape of the bomb package. And that and some other evidence, we went to trial. And he was convicted and got about 38 years in federal prison. Did he have a bomb-making experience in his background? I mean, it sounds like a guy knew what he was doing. No, no, he, he, he didn't. He had a brief military career, brief mm-hmm. unsuccessful mil- military career. We did not have luck. Uh, I don't remember now. Why it had to do with uh, maybe either where they lived or the type of system. We could not backtrack at, in that day. It was older. It was a few years ago. Could not backtrack his searches as as we can do today. Sure. So whether he, you know, looked at the anarchist cookbook or he got some other publication or whether he read about it uh, in some other fashion, we don't know how he learned to do it. But he built a beautiful bomb. It just didn't work that one time. I wonder if he built it there. Or somewhere else, or somehow the tape he used got the hair, but you never knew. Don't know. And he never talked. Never talked. It was packaged at his house because the hair from the dog got in the tape, and but we don't know where he built it, and we never found tools. It was it was a well tough case. But uh, at any rate, he did that because again power. He didn't want to lose control over. Her. By gosh, if she's going to be with anybody, it's him, and if not, he'll blow her up. Oh, I'll kill everybody. Kill everybody. Okay, interesting cases. That's going to conclude this episode of Justice Facts. And as we say, we always bring you current events and true crime. And we're seeing a spate of these murders right now, husbands of uh, their wives, and the wife disappears. Uh, this has really been interesting. And, of course, if you have any comments, you can always email us at fan at truecrimereporter.com. And, I urge you also to listen to our other podcast, True Crime Reporter. We're on all your podcast apps. So I'm Robert Riggs with our co-host, Bill Johnston, a former prosecutor. We'll be back next week with more. Thank you. Justice Facts is co-hosted by Robert Riggs and Bill Johnston. Associate producer, Siler Burr. Original music by Blair King. Social media producer, Grace Woodward. Publicity, Tim Livingston, PR. Graphics, Brian David Kerr Designs. Additional music by Stan Woodward. Justice Facts is a copyrighted production produced by True Crime Reporter.